Now what we want to talk about over the next uh, three classes is getting ready for that great day. Behold, I come quickly. And it's really important, brethren and sisters, in these last days that we don't get discouraged. Very important. Brother Thomas wrote, in faith in the last days, we need not be discouraged because of the stolid indifference of the people to the truth. Flesh and blood is naturally swinish and unimpressionable by the thoughts of God. That is so true. So we are a small people in a big earth. And by God's grace, we have been given a great gift. That is the gift of the gospel and understanding the things of the kingdom of God and the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And those things must elevate our thinking. We must never become discouraged. Let's again go to Brother Thomas. The time is short and the days are few and evil. A voice has resounded through the world calling your attention to the fact that the dispensation of the times under which we Gentiles live is fulfilled. We are satisfied that the time which remains is brief and that our external, eternal well-being demands that we not only believe that he will come but that we prepare to meet the Lord. Now that was written a long time ago but can you capture the excitement in that? So I believe, brothers and sisters, there are three areas that we need to really tune up as we wait for the Lord's return. And the three areas are family relationships, how we manage materialism and all its challenges, and how we live together in the household of God. Those three things, I believe, are critical to our life in the truth now like it's never been before. They've always been important, don't get me wrong, but I think now they're even more critical than they've ever been before. And what, what we're going to explore tonight in particular is the area of family life in the truth. How can we together, in our family units, become more convinced, more faithful, more powerful, more hopeful, more loving, that we might in turn build up the ecclesia? Because every part of this ecclesia is part of a family unit. And when those family units unite together, we've got the ecclesia of the living God. So that's what we want to talk about tonight. The next time we get together, in a couple of weeks, we want to talk about how do we manage this great problem to human beings of materialism. And it is a problem, regardless of who we are. And then finally, the ecclesia together. So let's make a few points. Our age is a fast change and rapid time of communications. There's never been a time when things are so interconnected, when messages travel so fast around this globe. Something happens here in little old Adelaide and they know in England in 30 seconds, not even that probably, 5 seconds, and vice versa. So now our whole brotherhood is under worldwide scrutiny. We're no longer just a little community separated away. We're now under scrutiny via the internet and via various communications. So everything we do as a community is under scrutiny. Sadly, I don't have Facebook by choice and I'm not critical of anyone who's got it, but, but in, on the internet, just go into the internet and sadly put in Christadelphia, and up will come, first of all, all those complaining about it. Ex-Christadelphians, Christadelphians that don't believe anymore, and so on and so on and so on. So our neighbour, came, my neighbour, Frank, next door, is a lovely man of 76 years old. And he's always pondering what life's all about. His wife died about 10 years ago. He lives quietly there, and he's quite an intelligent man. We've had a few talks together about the meaning of life. And so I said to him one day, Frank, I'm going to bring you some reading in. I'd like you to have a look at it. I know you're a big reader. You spend a lot of time reading. Have a read of this book and uh, the accompanying books and tell me what you think. And he brought them back in three days' time. 
And he said, Ray, I really appreciate your sentiment. I'm really thankful that you thought enough of me to bring these books in, but I'm OK, thanks. Now, he's got a friend who works in the state government who is in the area of uh, human resource development and looking after people in welfare. Spends a lot of time with her and I believe, and I, I may be wrong, but I believe that she's probably got on, not known Christadelphians probably, got on the internet, bought up Google, put in Christadelphians and up come all these terrible things said about us. What a shame. So we're under enormous scrutiny. We really are. Which means that we've got to watch it. Watch what we're doing. Now, probably most of us thought the last days, and I certainly did when I came into the truth 41 years ago, probably thought to myself, well, the last days, that's talking about outside, not talking about the ecclesia. But we know now that it's not only talking about outside, but it's also talking about inside. Men shall become. And what is now regarded as normal and, and plastered all over the press and media, television and radio is the regard as horrifying as it was long ago, horrifying, never talked about when we came into the truth, maybe in hushed tones, but never publicly. But now we've got partners and same-sex couples and that's perfectly normal. And we've got people running around with rainbows and all sorts of things saying they're part of our community and in fact to God they're detestable. And we've got to watch that those sorts of things don't have an impact on us. We really have to be careful. Our young people and our young marrieds need to take up the challenge. Because if it would happen that our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't return this year, and maybe, unforeseeable as it might be for us, he doesn't return for another 10 years, then people in my age group are going to disappear. And the younger ones are going to need to be the future of God's truth. So you young marrieds now who are coming up and the younger people in this ecclesia who are either newly baptised or certainly contemplating it, realise that you may one day soon be responsible for guiding your ecclesia. And all ecclesias, brothers and sisters, have problems. Both what we call the hardline ecclesias and the softer ecclesias. They're all, they've all got problems. One tree all's got problems. Every ecclesia has got problems. And that's just part of the fact that we are mortals. And we've got to work through those things. So something else is required. What is it that is required? Well, there's no good looking back, but we've got to take up the challenge. There's really no advantage in looking back, wishing that it was like it was in the older days, the older times. It's never going to be like that again. And each age has its wonderful aspects. Our age has its wonderful aspects. The world has always been the same. Flesh doesn't change. Times speed up, things speed up, but they're just the same. I remember a, an elderly sister saying to me about 12 months ago, I don't understand it, Ray, about all these changes in ecclesial life and, and people believing different things about creation. God doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. The Bible doesn't change. Why do we change? Good question. Well, very good question. So we need to take up the challenge. But there's no good being disappointed and getting downhearted. Not a time to become downhearted. Now here's a, there's a lovely letter in the Christadelphian from 18-something, uh, and I've only showed a tiny bit of it here. But this is the essence of Brother Thomas to Brother Roberts. Do not expect poor, decrepit, human nature to evolve holier influences now than it was socially capable of under the apostolic ministration of the Spirit. Ecclesiastical perfection is not to be expected in the absence of Christ. Till he comes, 
the wheat will be mingled with the tares in such proportion as to keep the faithful in tribulation and in the exercise of patience. How's that for maturity from a brother? So for a brother Roberts in his very early stages of development in the truth says, look at the ecclesias are in chaos and, and I don't know what to do about it. And brother Thomas says, hang on a minute, brother Roberts. In the time of the administration of the, epist of the spirit, the ecclesias had problems. Do you expect them to be better than that now? God has designed it so that the ecclesias are training grounds for the kingdom. And there is a balance that keep the faithful in tribulation and in the exercise of patience. You imagine, brethren and sisters and young people, if everything was perfect in ecclesial life. It's actually, after 41 years of Christadelphia, pretty hard to imagine. But if, how, how about if it was? What would it do for our faith and our spiritual development? Probably not much. Because we just weave along thinking everything's cosy. And human nature is not cosy. So we need to realise that we can't expect perfection this side of the kingdom. Now as I said before, there's no good wishing for the past. You know, Paul makes that very clear. Brethren, I count not myself yet to have laid hold, but one thing I do forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth to the things which are before, I press on toward the goal unto the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, if you went over to Philippians, and I don't need you to, if you went over, you would see in Philippians that that word reaching there is in italics. It's not actually in the Greek. But the word forth is, and that word forth means to stretch oneself onward. To stretch oneself onward. So that means it requires effort. So there's no good saying, I want to go back to where it was 20 years ago or 15 years ago or 5 years ago. God wants us to forget what's behind and stretch ourselves forward to the day of Christ. And that's what he expects us to do. And we need to be very careful. And I'll tell you why. Because we've got it all. We've got nice halls. You've got a nice hall. We've got a nice hall at One Tree Hill. We've got plenty of expositions. Our libraries are brimming with information about the Bible. We never need to be ignorant about any book of the Bible. We've got committees that run well for all things. We've got a worldwide connected brotherhood. We've got youth groups, care groups, schools and aged care facilities. And I'm not against any of those things. But we need to watch it. Because our real need is not to settle in comfortably into this age. Our real need is to stretch forward towards the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to find that word stretch again a little later this evening when we turn up a couple of quotes. So that's interesting. So just remember that idea of stretching forth, stretching forth, very important. Now, if you read any of the books concerning our early brethren's lives, Brother Thomas, Brother Roberts, um, Brother Carter, Brother C.C. Walker, or any of those brethren from that time, you will notice that their spirit was a spirit of devotion one, two, and three to the word of God. Their devotion was to the word of God and inquiry into the meaning which led Brother Thomas to leave his former associates and associations and give himself wholly to God. And all the rest of his life from that time forward was not about becoming rich or becoming famous or amassing friends or having a lot of fun or any of that. His whole life then was devoted to the word of God. And he did everything he could to investigate that word, to explore it and to explain it. I can remember reading about him at one stage 
when he took farming up to it, on the uh, end of his tray where he was farming, he had his Bible. And as he went along with the oxen pulling the, the thing along, ploughing up his ground, he had his Bible on top and he was reading it. See, that's devotion. I'm not suggesting you read your Bible on the way to work in the car, by the way. But that's devotion. That's devotion to the truth. Now, I think that's lacking a bit now with all of us. Not pointing the finger, but I think it's lacking a bit with all of us. Here's a quote from the Ambassador, 1867. Let the voice of truth in fraternal and kind contention for the faith be the authority of each. Let the voice of truth in fraternal and kind contention for the faith be the authority of each. So, brothers and sisters, that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. So, why do we value then our pioneer brethren so much? Well, we value them because of their early work. We value them because the brethren in that time laid the foundations and provides us with insights and stimulates enthusiasm and provides us with an orientation. In other words, it says, this is where we are in the kingdoms of men and this is about to happen. So the way that they have worked hard and slaved over their Bibles to unravel the prophecies of the Bible for us so that we can build on that with enthusiasm has provided us an orientation. And we've got an orientation as a community like no other in this earth. And our orientation is where we stand in relation to the return of Christ. And that ought to be our motivation all the time. The pioneer brethren left us an example of zeal, honest biblical exposition and great courage. And we need that today. And while our structures ecclesially grow, we cannot afford to lose the essence of those foundations. Now, ecclesias do grow. And they wane and they grow and they wane and they change shape. When we went to One Tree Hill 12 years ago, there was all little babies running around. Now they're all teenagers and young marrieds. So things happen in ecclesial life. Things change. And we've got to be prepared to go change and go with that. That's a very important issue. So by orientation, if we took a, a dictionary definition, it would mean locate oneself in one's environment with reference to time, place and people. Now, take the truth out of your life and watch your orientation. Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 and party time on the weekend. That's the world. That's the way it operates. And the orientation is having an early night, Sunday night, so you can get up and go to work Monday. And then you go to work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is the midweek, it starts to slide down, you slide into Thursday, Friday, yippee, it's Saturday again, and away you go. That's the orientation of the world. That's not the orientation of Christadelphians. The orientation of Christadelphians is Christ's return, the major orientation of our early brethren, and it certainly needs to remain ours. Now, our brother kindly read uh, today for us 1st of Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's turn that up. It's a brilliant chapter. Very small chapter, but it's got three extremely important principles in it that we need to put into operation in our life. Now, I'm going to put the principles up and we're going to call them operating principles. And the first four verses say this, and we'll go in from verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labour of love and patience of hope. Now in my Bible I've coloured those in. Work of faith, labour of love, patience of hope. In our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. So the first thing that we've got to think about, brethren and sisters and young people, is that we are elected by God. We're not sitting in this hall by a fluke. 
And it doesn't matter whether we come through the Sunday school or whether we came into the truth by a lecture or someone giving us a leaflet. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that none of us here are here by a fluke. We're all being called by God. And we are called, as Paul says there, beloved, your election of God. Now the margin offers in my Bible, by God. It doesn't matter. Of God or by God, doesn't matter. Same point is made. Now what's the next operating principle for the Christadelphians? Well, we find that in verses 5 to 8. For our gospel came not only our, sorry, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God would is spread abroad. So what were they, brethren and sisters? They were exemplary. They were exemplary. They become... They become followers and they were examples of the Apostle Paul. Followers and examples. And not only that, but in, in the last couple of verses, they are said to be an expectant people. And that's what we've got to be. Notice that. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait. And those words are emphatic in the, Hebrew, in the Greek. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Isn't that wonderful? We are delivered, brethren and sisters, from the wrath to come. And it's coming. And it's coming hard. So we're an elect people, we're an exemplary people, and we're an expectant people. So God's chosen us, we've got to be examples, and we've got to, we're not only examples, but we've also got to be followers and examples of the apostles, and we've got to be waiting expectantly for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that gives us an operating principle in our lives. That gives us an operating principle. But let's look at that a little bit closer. Verses 1 to 4. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labour of love, patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, beloved brethren, and, that, and the American Standard Version says, beloved of God, your election of God. Now Jews applied the title beloved of God to those who were regarded as supremely great men. Now in Christ it's applied to the humblest of the Gentiles. And he also speaks of their election of God or by God and that means according to Vincent's word studies selected for a special mission. So you're not sitting in this hall by a fluke. You're sitting this in this hall because you've been elected by God for a special mission. What's that special mission? At the moment, it's to preach the kingdom of God to those outside and to look after and encourage and love and respect our brethren and sisters. That's our job at the moment. And we're elected to that. And we need to be, as he says in verse 5 to 8, an exemplary people. And you became followers, you can see there the, the idea of the Greek, an imitator of us and of the Lord. So here they are, the Thessalonians, they're imitators both of, of, of Paul and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a pretty good thing to say about a group, isn't it? That they're the examples, that they're, they're followers of us and of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction. 
So they received the word in much affliction, but in the joy of understanding God's truth. So that they were not only followers, but examples. We know that word, tupos, which means a die. They were struck in the die of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had stamped his impression upon them. Paul was the Christ of the Gentiles and he'd stamped his impression on them. And they were just like a die. They were an imitator or a follower and a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So brethren and sisters, that's what we need to be. And then he says we need to have that expectancy. We need, we're called upon to serve and to wait patiently for glory. And that word wait there means in the Greek to expect. So it's not like we're just sitting around, oh, it won't be long now and Christ will be back. But it's an expectation. It's an excitement about Christ's coming. And the Amplified Bible picks it up and says, look forward to and wait. Look forward to and wait. So there's a, there's a degree of looking and a degree of patience, waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now a similar word is used in the Hebrew when, when Jeremiah, God through Jeremiah says, I know the thoughts I think about you, they're thoughts of good and not of evil, to bring you to a great expectation, as the Hebrew has it, to bring you to a great expectation. And that great expectation, brethren and sisters, is the kingdom. And we're going to be part of that kingdom by God's grace. We've got to wait. We've got to wait. And we've got this excitement going on in our bodies. We've got to wait. But we're excited about that. Now what's the world doing? Well, sadly, the world's like the old pagan system. This was taken off a, a, a Roman gravestone. And it sums up, I think, the, today's preeminent thought. I was not, I became, I am not, I care not. See, men are like the beasts that perish. When there's no hope in a human being, they were not, they became, they were not, they're not anymore and they care not. They just go into the grave and die. That's not us, brethren and sisters. We're not like that. We don't think like that. We've got an expectation and an orientation. So what do we need to do today? Well, we need to really appreciate what we have been given. And it's the gift of God. We don't earn it. It's a gift. We need to utilise and build on the work of those who have preceded us. Now I would say that, um, if I can use the example of, of the Ecclesia at One Tree Hill, we are what we might call a pioneer-oriented Ecclesia. We're not fanatics about it. But we do greatly respect the pioneers and you'll often hear our brethren talking about the pioneers or quoting them. So what we're doing is deliberately keeping a pioneer orientation so that we've got that excitement. We know that the prophecies are being fulfilled. Along with that, we've got to have an immovable commitment. Now in other words, we've got to make a determination like Daniel did. I made a covenant with my eyes. So we've got to make a covenant with our hearts and we've got to be immovable in our commitment. We've got to have very clear objectives in the truth. And the big picture is the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And we must appreciate the great treasure of our family. And when I talk about families, I'm talking about mum and dad and the two or three kids or whatever it is in your own little family unit when you close the door of a night who's in there mum and dad and two or three children or four or maybe more in our house it's Kay and I and Lottie the poodle all our children are gone and they've all developed their own little families now and that's a great thing but we've got to greatly respect and appreciate the treasure of our family. It is a great treasure, brethren and sisters, to have a family in the truth. A great treasure. And we've got to believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently stretch towards him. He will reward. So if I was going to say to you tonight, what, what is your goal? 
What is your real goal? Probably many of you would say, well, I want to be in the kingdom, and that's good. Or you might say, I want to be like the Lord Jesus Christ more and more every day, and that's great. Or I want to greatly appreciate what God has done for me and be more appreciative every day. Or I want to go out and preach the truth more vigorously every day. And all those things are great. And I was thinking about David. And in 1 Chronicles 16 and verse 11 he says, Seek Yahweh and his strength. Seek his face continually. That's not a bad objective, is it? Or a goal. Seek Yahweh and his strength. Seek his face continually. Well, you know, that word there, the root word of to uh, seek there is the idea to stretch. And it's exactly the word that we find in Proverbs 6.21. And you can look it up later for a little bit of Bible study homework and see what the connection is. So we've got to be stretching towards God's presence continually. That is a great goal for a Christadelphian. Because that then covers off a lot of other things. If we're seeking Yahweh and his strength and seeking his face continually, we're going to be looking after one another, aren't we? We're going to be appreciating our little family unit. We're going to be preaching out to other people. Because if we seek Yahweh and his strength and seek his face continually, our orientation is going to be in the truth and not in the world. And we're going to control a lot, a lot of things in our lives a lot better if we get up and, and seek God. I don't know how, um, in your particular family units, you handle the readings, and that's very much your business. We've tried a lot of different methods over a lot of years, and it's always different in different types of family settings. When, when you've got children, as we did, four children at home and varying age groups, I'm in the truth at 30 years old, I've got a family and I've got to try and get them around the readings and, and talk the truth to them, and I don't know much myself. So that was an awkward period of my life in the truth. It got better. People helped and it got better. And now it's just Sister Kay and I at home, and we do the readings in a different way again. But we don't miss them unless there is some consequence that comes up that prevents us from doing it. Otherwise, we take the time to let it sink into our minds. Now, this is an imperative for Christadelphians. I don't mind how you do the readings uh, and, and what parts of it you do at what time, but getting that word sinking into this every day is an imperative for a Christadelphian. It's got to happen. And it's not just a matter of listening or reading, it's a matter of hearing the word of God. So the family unit is not of human origin. Or is it primarily for social convenience? Though the social commentators might say that it is, but it's not. It's nothing to do with that. The family unit was established by God and the reason for that was that it might contribute towards the divine purpose to fill the earth with his glory. Husbands, love your wives. And be prepared to give your life for them as Christ did for the ecclesia. Children, obey your parents. All these things are designed by God for us to unite and work in families together that we might become a little cell of the Golden Grove Ecclesia, a little cell of strength for the Golden Grove Ecclesia. Now, you think of this, Psalm 78. Wonderful psalm, just in our readings a couple of days ago. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, which should arise and declare them, who should arise and declare them to their children. So the truth's got to go on and on and on. And the only way to do that 
It's by getting the testimony of God and letting it sink into this and changing us from the inside out. It's the only way in which we can do it. Now notice that. That they might set... Now that word in the Hebrew means put a chair on a flat surface. That's how we'd say it in modern English today. So that, that they might set, that they might put a chair on a flat, safe surface, their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Israel forgot God. Continually forgot God. We're going through Exodus at the moment. How soon they forgot. How soon they said to Aaron, build us a God. Build us a God. Moses is not coming down. Build us a God. So they didn't take them long to forget. And sadly, brethren and sisters, we can too. I wouldn't suggest for a moment that a Christadelphian would totally forget God deliberately in their life. But the pressures of everyday life can eradicate God's influence out of our life to some degree. We've got to be very, very careful. Deuteronomy, we might remember, chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I, emphatic in the Hebrew, which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Not just here, but it transfers into here, into our way of life. It becomes in our heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And you know, in the Hebrew, the mood there in that text is the infinitive mood, mood which means no time restrictions. You can do that any time you like. Keep doing it, God says. Keep telling your children about the truth. Be aware, lest thou forget Yahweh, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt. Now, it sounds incredible that that would happen, but it can. Now, there's a, a contemporary Christian writer, done a lot of work on family life. He looks at it from a church perspective, but many of his stuff can be translated into our life. He says this, We may be watching the death of the germ cell of all civilization. The family. Signs of the family's demise are abundantly clear all around us. You know, I know of families in the meeting who don't sit down and eat a meal together. Who independently make their meals and sit down in their own little areas of comfort and have their meals by themselves. Dangerous stuff. The writer goes on to say, numerous facts confirm the grim prognosis there's almost no need to cite statistics. Well, that's true. You go and get the local advertiser and look at the first three or four pages and that'll be enough for you to know that things are not good in families in the world. Not good at all. And all the issues that we've got now with people changing their thinking through drugs is greatly affecting family life. Some of us have sadly experienced that in our own families. And we know what havoc that can bring upon a family. So young people, if you ever have an inkling that you're going to change your thinking through taking drugs, forget about it. Please, don't even consider that for a second because it's only going to lead to disaster. Absolute disaster. So, the writer goes on to say, Consequently, the proponents of anti-family social engineering are busy re-educating the young people 
who will soon be the main leaders of society and the parents of the generation that will probably be even more dysfunctional than the current one. Think about that. So all, the, all these social re-engineering experts who think they know better than God are re-engineering family life. So you can have two mums or two dads. That's fine, they say. You do what you like. The children will be really happy with two mums or two dads. What absolute rubbish. But, you know, that's making families more dysfunctional than the current ones. And you imagine when those poor little kids grow up that have had two mums or two dads most of their life, what they're going to be like when they walk into the world. It is so sad. But we have very lofty principles, brethren and sisters and young people. Very lofty principles. Uh, let's have a look at some of those. What lofty principles we have in Yahweh's purpose for a family? Think about the huge difference between the human and the divine perspective. It's massive, the difference between divine thinking and merely human thinking. It is the divine purpose that we need to keep in our minds through the word entering all the time and act upon it. That will keep our family unit safe and tight and loving and united. And in view of Christ's return, we should be helping our family unit, your family unit, to develop character, the character of Christ, to grow in faith and hope and love. Now, God gives us that faith originally, but we've got to make that grow within us and spread that to other people. And with that faith growing comes hope and a demonstration of the love of Christ to others. And we need to get the right balance in our family life. No one can sit all day doing that. There's other things we must do in our lives. I'm retired now, but for many years I had to go and earn a living. So that took eight or twelve hours a day. So that was eight or twelve hours I wasn't doing that. And then you've got to spend time with your family. There's got to be some good times, some fun times. You've got to have a few games around the table together with the younger ones. So that takes time. But that's all part of getting the right balance in your life. Mum and dads have got to take the responsibility for getting this out at the appropriate time and explaining it and reading it and giving the kids some excitement about the Bible. And we also need the balance of having some fun time together around a game of you know or something. Probably not known anymore, you know, but it was a good game once. Or Canasta or 500 or something. But we need to get that balance correct. We need that. Really do need that. And we need to develop a spirit in our family of forgiveness. A family can't operate together unless they forgive one another. Annika and I have got a rule, well, rule, agreement, that we, we would never go to bed of a night still having ill feeling towards each other. So we occasionally have a tiff, I think all people do. But we never go to bed dwelling upon that. We always re resolve that problem and it's normally done within about 10 minutes of the rift. We've been practising it for a long time so we've pretty got it pretty well now. But, you know, you've got to do that. Here's a little note from the, uh, from the Christadelphian uh, and it's a nice little note and it says, The lesson for the Christian Jew and the Christian Gentile is the great truth that Jesus Christ is the most illustrious example of faith we're called upon to exercise. He is the leader of all who strive to live by faith. If we try to conform to his image in discipline, in endurance, in suffering, we may confidently hope to live with him and share his God-given tasks. Now that was written in 2001, which is not a long time ago. It's 
beautifully written. What about family hope? So if we're in a Christadelphian family unit, we've got a hope, haven't we? A really strong hope. And so Psalm 39 says, And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions and make me not the reproach of the foolish. That was the hope of the psalmist. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. Now they're hopes that are in our families, brethren and sisters, the same hopes that are in the psalmist and in Paul. Those same hopes are in our families. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in Yahweh his Elohim. So if you've got, if you've got the God of Jacob for your help, then your hope is in Yahweh his Elohim. We're very blessed, brethren and sisters, to have that. I went to a uh, coffee shop in the Norwood Parade when I was in business with a brother to meet a potential client. And I walked up to the table where I saw the brother sitting with, with the potential client and I, I was introduced to the potential client by the brother and the potential client said this, if you Christians want us to look at your religion, you've got to try to look more comfortable in possession of it yourselves. In other words, he was saying to me, and then he translated that, he said, you might look miserable. If you, if you know what you say you know, what do you look so miserable about? You should be the happiest people in the world. I looked at the brother, the brother looked at me, and later on we discussed it at great length. And I think he had a point. I think he had a point. Okay, well, we've got to wrap this up in one minute, so we will continue this on at the start of our next study. But let's just think about learning as a family, learning in a family. Later on, I'm going to, I'm going to quote two people on our last slide for the night. Who, whose words helped Kay and I greatly through the years. We heard one of them extremely early in our life in the truth and the other one a bit later on. But learning as a family, what do we learn to do? Well, we teach our kids to love their enemies. We teach our children that it's not a frightening thing to admit that you don't know everything. We teach our children to withhold judgment. We say to them, you can't be respectful of persons we're all one in Christ. We don't have the downwind syndrome. Don't get down there with them. You might catch something off them down there. We teach our children to, to persevere without haste. We teach them to wait without impatience. We teach them to suffer without complaint. We teach them to know when to keep silent and to concentrate in the midst of strife and pressure and turmoil. Now, if you as a family mum and dad and the children can learn those things together, you're doing a great thing to strengthen that little family cell that it might strengthen the Golden Grove Ecclesia or whatever ecclesia you belong to. So the final thing tonight is a quote from two brethren. The first one we heard last. So I'll quote the first one first. Brother Arthur Pennington used to come to Melbourne in the 70s, in the mid-70s, and he used to show his temple, study on the temple on glass slides. That's how long ago it was. No PowerPoint. He used to put glass slides in a projector and, and I used to meet at, uh, incidentally, we had the classes at Uncle Harry Hall's place and Aunty Eunice's place and we used to sit around and one night he looked at us all and he said, you know, brethren and sisters, I'm going to tell you something here tonight that might frighten you a bit. But he said, if the truth is going to survive in the latter days, it will be in families. I've come to believe that he's right. And he's talking about little units of strength that keep ecclesias going. 
When you come along and you're excited about the truth and you're looking for Christ's return and you can forgive people, be patient and love your brethren and sisters regardless, then you're going to support and help that ecclesia enormously. And the other one was Brother Perce Mansfield who said at a Bible school once, every family is a vital cell of the ecclesia. And I sat there up at Rathmines and went, wow, I hadn't thought of that before, but he's right. Every family is a vital cell in the ecclesia. So every family here tonight, brethren and sisters, here at the Golden Grove Ecclesia, every young person that's in a family setting, baptised or not at this stage, you're a vital cell for the well-being of this ecclesia at Golden Grove. The way you work your family life, getting the balance right, loving one another, understanding there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, integrating other interests into our lives as well that we need. We all need some other things to do. And family and ecclesial balances, all that's got to work right. If we get that right, we're going to be a nice little strength to our ecclesia. And when Christ returns, brethren and sisters and young people, God willing, he will say to us, well done. Enter you into the joy of your Lord.